everyone, and welcome to the NBA Show Reviews. This is James Cork, and as always, I have here with me Norman Sanso. Hello, hello. Uh, what was that? I don't know. What? Won? Oh my gosh. And awesome brownie reviewer, Silver Quill. Yeah, I'm a rock monster now, you mooks. I'm the least threatening in- monster in Equestria. If we're still like this, I'm going to start reviewing the, the 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 comics in Spanish. Let's see how well you guys fare with that. I would like to see you editing that, Norman. Oh God, es... a square word. Huh? No. Es bueno, sí. <laughs> muy bueno, muy bueno, me gusta. Por, por supuesto. <laughs> ah, señor, please, oh, I'm not going to go back to Mexico. <laughs> Oh my gosh. We are already jumping off the rails. Uh, and uh, today we are reviewing the issue number three of the Friends Forever comics. That is the one with Princess Celestia and Spike in it. Uh, written by Ted Anderson with art by Agnes Garbowska. And, well, this... Wow, I don't know. Re- I really don't know how to start with the synopsis of this comic. It's actually rather simple. Uh... Uh, Princess Celestia is just tending to her duties. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, she has duties. Mm-hmm. And Spike visits her, saying, can you please help me find a present for Twilight Sparkle? And uh, Celestia is, is like, sure, of course, let's go find a present for Twilight Sparkle. Then they go uh, on an adventure to find a present, a present for Twilight. And uh, will they find it? Will they not? Well, you will have to figure out that by reading the comic if you haven't read it yet. Because now we're going to go hip deep into spoilers to talk about what this comic is all about. So, yeah, from now on it's all spoilers. So if you guys haven't read the comic, go give it a read. Because, like I said in the previous one, on my humble opinion, this one is actually really worth your time. But let's go ahead and talk about it. And like always, inverted alphabetical order, we start with silver and uh, we finish up on me. So let's go for it, guys. Alrighty. Well, this is my second favorite uh, issue of the Friends Forever line to date. Uh, at the time of this recording, there are 13 issues out there. Ooh, very unlucky. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> this ranks numero dos on my favorites. Uh, we'll get to numero uno in due time. What I like about this is that it deals with an issue I've, I've had with the show for a while. I've said before that I am not anti-Celestia, but I do have a lot of trouble with how she's presented in the show. I view her as this very experienced, knowledgeable, and uh, strong leader. But her best qualities are always shown off screen. You know, it's uh, that classic line, what you don't see today is what I did. (laughs) Uh, You know, there's no crime. Well, there's very little crime. There's no apparent poverty, no homeless ponies. There's peace. I, I say that's a thousand years of Celestia's rule kind of worked out i think it has to uh, go without saying when you live in a such a such an idyllic uh, society where there is basically there is no petty crimes there is no thievery um at least from what we get in the show in the comics everything happens in the comics there's thieves there's fiends there's everything but when you have such an idyllic society it is very easy to get bored even of your own reign so yeah. i can kind of understand celestia uh, aching for some action <laughs> Which she does in this comic. She becomes proactive. And best of all, she does it, She does so with Spike, who also doesn't really get to take center stage in a positive way most often. These two characters tend to be poorly represented in the show. Spike the comedic uh, relief, Celestia the exposition slash damsel in distress. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, no, that Celestia has been rescued even more times than Princess Peach at this point. <laughs> She's, oh, she's always in trouble. She's always needing to be helped. I don't know. Peach has really got that Stockholm Syndrome going. <laughs> <laughs> well, who says that Celestia and Discord don't have the same thing? Oh, God. <laughs> Ooh, we're going kinky. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I love this guy. Oh, God. <laughs> but, uh, so this is an adventure where we learn a little bit more about the world from Celestia's point of view and how in some ways I think she feels limited in her role. And while again, the comics are a separate continuity from the show in my mind, I like this presentation of her character that she feels sometimes limited by her role and wishing she could be more active. 
the only downside uh, to this comic in my eyes are, well, one, her assertion that she could have she could have taken care of many of the villains herself. Uh, we'll get into that. But mm-hmm. um, also the rock lobsters <laughs> rock were lobsters. some of the... They were some of the most bizarre and, quite frankly, unthreatening, non-threatening uh, creatures you could ever throw into this comic. The only thing sillier were the spiders and top hats from the first arc of the main series. Why are they wearing top hats? <laughs> Bully. They, they, they look like they just fell from a badly written SpongeBob SquarePants episode, to be perfectly honest with you. They even kind of have that same uh, fringe, weird look with the big eyes and the over-the-top ex- expressions. That Yeah, that is typical for the MLP series, but do they look out of place? <laughs> oh, they look really out of place. And, uh, what, what about you, Norman? What do you think? Uh, I don't know. When I first read this comic, I, I find it... Oh, God, Princess Celestia Spike comic. What can they do? And as I kept on reading... I enjoyed it a lot. I just love what the what's the message they're trying to send to us. Um, at first, I didn't like the art, but as time goes by, um, this is the same guy that did the what you call this Spike Micro and also the Fluttersh- um the Trixie arc for the mainline comics if i'm not mistaken yeah yeah agnes agnes garboska is uh she she did a good couple of the friends forever comics but on the main series she has only done the Trixie manhattan mystery diamond arc yeah and with garboska's art it's a acquired taste if you don't like her art it's not your fault it's an acquired taste what about you james well, um, I didn't really feel much for this comic at the beginning because I'll have to be honest with you, out of the all the characters in the show, uh, there are a few that I don't really care much for. And uh, get ready with the view in tra- with the booing track, Silver. You're gonna need it because I'm gonna okay, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I don't really care much for Princess Celestia. That was the wrong sound. <laughs> I defy your expectations. Oh my gosh! But yeah, no, really, I didn't give too too much of um for her character. I don't, I didn't care much for her. But that's because we don't have a lot to work with. Uh, what we see of Celestia in the show is very, very scarce. Not enough to actually care for her as a character. Mm-hmm. Hell, I would go so far as saying that Sapphire Shore has Sapphire Shores has almost more of a character than Celestia does at this point. They kind of like sideline her in favor of giving Twilight a bit more of a screen time, and even what Twilight got wasn't enough. I'm going off on another tangent, I'm sorry. But funny enough, in the comics, we are actually given a lot. Uh, not just with her micro-comic, but with the Friends Forever and with the main series. We actually get a lot of Celestia, and uh, we can care enough about her with that. So yeah, uh, by the end of this comic, I actually was pretty enthralling what Celestia is as a character. I really like her. I think this represents the character properly. Uh, similar with Spike. I didn't give too much of a, of a crap about Spike. But uh, by the end of this comic, I was actually caring for him. So, yeah, if this comic did something right, was um, making me feel interested and invested in this uh, two usually unappreciated characters in the show. And I agree with you, Norman, about the art of Agnes Garbowska. Sometimes it's really, really fun and really good, and other times it looks very weird. <laughs> and now that I remember, she also did the artwork for the Spike Micro. Yeah, that's what I mentioned before. Yes, I forgot. She did the art for the Spike Micro. Yep. So she's used to draw a Spike at this point. Yeah. yeah. So anywho, um, spoilers ahead, yo. Yeah, let's go and start reviewing the comic once, uh, uh, one page at a time. So let's begin. So right away from the first page, I was already falling in love with that comic because look at that. That's Prince Silver Shadow. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Prince I'm... Silver Shadow. <laughs> oh, oh, the Duke of Appaloosa. The Duke of Appaloosa. And I don't know how many of you guys remember this, but uh, there was this is a reference to the TV show Hot in Cleveland, uh, where they had an episode where a a firefighter, uh, a fireman, 
happens to be a Trekkie and a Brony, and he goes to a Brony convention dressed as his own OC, who happens to be a guy called Prince Silver Saddle, who is exactly like that, wearing a big hat on his head. <laughs> Yeehaw! You know what? I don't know if that will be misrepresentation of or what. I watched the episode. I have the episode, actually. Mm-hmm. How is the it? guy... Well, it's awesome because the guy ends up saving two people at the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. And he gets the girl at the end. So if awesome. anything, is like, wow, wow, whoa. You're, you're going really far making the brownies look good. Okay, okay. Uh, side tangent here, side tangent here. Um... That guy, brony joke, ahaha, mainstream TV, yeah, it's strange and whatnot. But he's a firefighter. It's his job to save people. So, yeah, firefighters and public service people have other hobbies too. <laughs> uh, sorry. I well, I li- I like I like the cameo. I think it's a funny cameo. And of course, in the next uh, in the next panels, we are uh, introduced to Spike, who's looking for. Uh, Celestia for help because they he needs to get Twilight a present uh, because Twilight's birthday is coming. Interesting after Spike missed the last birthday that she had. If you remember in Rarity Takes Main, no, in in um, Sweet and Elite, it was Twilight's birthday and Spike wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Wait, what? So it, are you talking? This is continuation. Uh, no, is the the fact that finally Spike is going to be able to give. Twilight a present because in the last birthday she, uh, he couldn't he couldn't get her anything. Oh yeah, okay. Yes. So Celestia has the, uh, Celestia says, "Oh, what do you think we should get her?" And Spike is like, "Oh, maybe may we could get her a new telescope because the one that she has is very old and uh, rusty." So they call for the astronomer of the castle called Starry Eyed, and I'll have to say he looks so weird the first thing that we see him. I think it's more because he's freaky eye. Though that eyeball is huge. I, I think and it's this more is... of the eyelash or eyebrow. Eyebrow is a good, good lord. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I haven't seen eyebrows like that since Tekken. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Tekken topa a level of eyebrow. <laughs> but but it's also his his pupils are so Sorry. small in that sea of white. Oh, but, yeah. I mean, you compare that to Celestia, who's probably got comparable eye size, but her her uh, iris and cornea, they oh, take up yeah. a good chunk of real estate. Yeah. If yes. you also took a look at Raven and the guards, they're proportionate to normal size. I, I think um, who here is um, starry-eyed is just, yeah. <laughs> also, problems. I don't know if you... I don't know if you guys noticed, but his cutie mark is the cutie, his cutie mark is the constellation of Pegasus, <laughs> and he's a unicorn. <laughs> so uh, would you say he's an alicorn? <laughs> I think there's I also know. a background pony who ha- in the show who has that constellation, um, and he too but, he too is a is a unicorn. I gotta look this up well, now. Doesn't doesn't Twilight's dad has uh, the constellation of Orion on his butt? I don't remember. Let's see here. Hmm. Well, th- there. Well, it's not the same constellation, but there is a character named Orion. Orion. Who usually, yeah. who usually appears as a. Well, sometimes he's an Earth pony. Sometimes he's a unicorn. I guess it depends on how he feels that day. <laughs> and he has a. He has. Oh, conveniently enough, uh, Orion is his uh, cutie mark. <laughs> the fans weren't terribly original when they were naming him. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, uh, oh my god. Are we getting sidetracked? Yeah. It's like we don't want to talk about this this comic and I mm. kind of actually really do because this one is yeah. uh, this one is yeah. good, but okay. So or I, uh, uh Starry Eyed he's like, "Oh, you want to get uh, Twilight a telescope? Hmm. I, I actually need to get new lenses to work on a new telescope. So maybe you should go to Crystal Mountain." Oh, I'm sorry. Did you see the exclamation point on top of my head? This is sounding like a World of Warcraft quest. Hmm. <laughs> Speaking of unoriginal names, Crystal Mountain. Wow. Really uh, testing the boundaries. Crystal Mountain next to the wet river and the very tall tree made of bark. <laughs> you mean wood. Don't get lost. <laughs> but, yeah, so Celestia and Spike are, uh, Starry Eyed is like, will you want to accept this quest? And Celestia and Spike are like, yeah, we are the horde. <laughs> so, 
So they get together and they uh, they get ready to go to the Crystal Mountain to retrieve those two lenses. So Starry I can make the telescope for Twilight. Mm-hmm. So Celestia is like, uh, Raven, please cancel all of my appointments. I have to go finish this dungeon. <laughs> And so they both go together, uh, Celestia and Spike, to go retrieve those lenses. Yeah, with some awkward silence in the very beginning too. <laughs> this very fun fact about what Princess Celestia talks to Spike. Because, okay, um, the line goes, Sorry, Celestia, I mean princess, I, I mean your majesty. Please, don't be so formal, Spike. I'm only a princess of ponies. You're a dragon. I'm not royalty to you. Um, thanks, Celestia? I mean, that line there, it's... what? (laughs) Yeah, I'm actually not a fan of that line. Spike's a resident. He takes part in their lives. Mm -hmm. He's even... uh, In Dragon Quest, he identified himself as a pony. Uh He's one of of her subjects. Here's the thing, here's the thing. No matter who you are, where you're from, once you go into another person's country, and if that person's country has royalty, you respect said royalty because you're in their land. I guess it has more to do with the fact that Celestia feels like um, she's like, I am finally able to get out of the castle. Oh my god, I need to relax. Can you please stop reminding me that I'm a ro- that I'm a royal? Hmm. Like uh, Celestia has always been kind of like the. This is one thing that I really appreciate of the character. She has always been the humble one. She has never been the one to rub the the, the title on your face or anything. Else. None of the princesses has been like this, except well, maybe a Princess Luna a little bit, but yeah, that's like uh, yeah, because... uh, uh, yeah, fair, fair with the catching up with the times. Let's see, uh, th- thou thou thou, um, and yeah, I I, I guess. Celestia is kind of like, yeah, no, don't, don't worry, don't don't sweat it. It's okay. You don't have to worry about formalities here. Okay, okay, fine. But yeah, once they establish that it's okay to uh, call each other by their uh, their first proper names, name. yeah, by their first name, uh, I really like the dialogue that they have between each other. Um, I think this is the strongest point of the comic to me is that their interaction doesn't feel forced. Is uh, an Right away, it's it starts to like um, build up that oh wow, from being too similar, to, uh, so different, they actually have one thing in common: is that they get shoved to the side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, as they walk to the, to the mountains and get distracted, they get assaulted by a rejected design from a SpongeBob cartoon. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Here it comes with the, with the rock lobsters. Stop right there, you mooks. <laughs> what you got here, eh, gay? <laughs> Sorry, you know what? That voice that voice fits them perfectly. It does. <laughs> I mean those the mustachio look, the the big grins, the tough guy talk. <laughs> well, I could do this. If someone wants to do a fanfic or reading, I, I could do it. Yay! <laughs> there, there you wow. go. I'm I'm most surprised about the fact that wow these these lobsters are really dumb because inadvertently they just caused some sort of like uh how do you call it <laughs> diplomatic <laughs> diplomatic conflict between the rock lobster society and the equestrian society. You have a princess in your cell. That's yeah. not smart guys. You have no idea how much trouble you're going to get into. An, uh, an international incident. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And even Celestia reminds them of that. It's like, I'm Princess Celestia, rightful ruler of all of Equestria. You oh, will. Oh, I will. I'm not oh, going princess, to. Oh, princess, eh? Well, then we should put you up for a royal suite. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm learning all sorts of new things about you today, dude. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Me- <laughs> meanwhile, Luna's, uh, Luna's at the Castle of Parapets screaming, <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's like, I'll do whatever I want, and then stuffs her face with cake. Yum, yum, and, then, yum, yum, yum. <laughs> and meanwhile, Kate and Twilight are like, Hey, what about us? Oh wait, she's still a unicorn. In- no wait, she's an unicorn in this. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's an unicorn. Strange. In but anywho, after being put into the royal suite. <laughs> yeah, but what a royal suite, by the way. 
there comes probably my my favorite part of the entire comic, and I know it's kind of weird that it happens right away, but it is an awesome dialogue. Is that uh, Spike is like, oh, I, it's it's terrible. I yeah, I'm just a sidekick. Well, everyone everyone else just goes to fight all of these other monsters and creatures and everything. Is like I feel so left behind. And Celestia is like, yeah, I feel the same way. <laughs> Boom, so good. I love that line. It's like, wow, really? And when you think about it, it is true. Celestia has always, since the beginning of the show even, uh, has always been put aside for uh, the sake of the main six, getting all of the getting all of the attention. Every time there has been a conflict, it's either the main six or uh, uh, Shane Narmor Cadence and the plot MacGuffin uh, to, <laughs> save the, to save the day. Uh, it has never been something that Celestia has had under control. The only thing she saved was uh, uh, when she banished Princess Luna uh, to the moon, and when she and Luna defeated Discord, and when they imprisoned Sombra, who took away the Crystal Empire thousands of years ago. So, like, when you think about it, Celestia hasn't been doing a lot lately. She has turned into a sidekick. Or a teacher. And she says a teacher is not an adventurer. Or, well, she actually says princesses are not usually adventurers, which that's making a commentary on uh, folklore, isn't it? Yeah, true, true, true. I, too, love this characterization that Celestia feels bound by her duties. She's keeping things together behind the scenes, but she has to re- leave the dangerous stuff to Twilight. And yet that's a that's a better representation than what I've seen in the show at times. Like, I still call foul when... Celestia says we have to get rid of our alicorn magic than actually, you know, do something. Well, technically, uh, no, I do review for another day. No, no, we, can, we can hash this out. We actually touched that upon our review of uh, the season four finale. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. if you want to know about that, go watch it. But it is yeah. not the point for today. Yeah, no, not no. today. But there are times where I feel like they're shuffling Celestia out the door for just to give Twilight sake, yeah. convenience sake, yeah. But then you have both this comic and the first arc of the main series where Celestia was handling 50 other <laughs> threats to Equestria and was out of contact. Will you give her the reasons why she's not involved? She instantly becomes more likable and her frustration becomes believable. Well, that's the thing with Celestia herself. She's ruled Equestria for over a thousand years. And I'm thinking she has tips and tricks of how to handle things. And knowing how she works, knowing stuff, she gives other ponies opportunity that she knows they can, they can do. In certain situations, with how the first arc went, there's magical creatures coming in, um, everything's getting super powerful, she needs to step in, or else... And she knows Twilight can do a good job, and it's all part of the test. I'm always a little worried about that logic, that basically, if you say, oh, this was just part of a test, she meant for this to happen, that can be used to justify just about anything. No, um, what what I meant was... And, sorry, and, go ahead. And it's, I, don't, I don't mean to diminish it. She is very good at taking a bad situation and turning it into a lesson. But usually it's not that I get... The sense she hasn't engineered the bad situation. No. She's just making the best of it. Yeah. What, what I meant to say was Celestia knows pers- a, a pony's characteristic. And doing so, like, for example, if she knows during the Paris Sprite invasion and whatnot, she knows that Twilight's derping and she knows what would Twilight do. So instead of, yeah, she'll just go there and like, oh, hello, Twilight Sparkle. Oh, I need to go to another place because there's infestation there. So, yay. That actually gets into a line Celestia says after they get out. So, we should talk about how Spike gets out. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Back to the comic. Back to the comic. Yeah, and I really like how imaginative is the way he gets out of the out of the jail because he tricks the lobsters into making them believe that he can actually eat rocks. Oh. When of co- and, you know, for a moment, he actually fooled me because I don't see any difference between the rocks and actual diamonds. But, wow, is that a bold move. <laughs> and very clever as well. Because if he can eat the rocks and the lobsters are made of rocks, he's going to make <laughs> roasted lobster by for dinner. 
<laughs> so yeah. it's it's it, it's funny. These lobsters are more afraid of them being eaten by a tiny dragon <laughs> than being sucked into submission by an all powerful, a thousand years old uh, pony princess. <laughs> well, well, you don't want to take a, a rock eating dragon for granted. <laughs> <laughs> I I hate that I actually had took that long to 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 get that joke. <laughs> Well, it's okay. We're all Shale and Hardy. <laughs> Is this really going to be a thing with, from now on? With uh, many layers. I'd say it'd be stratified. Still like might. Uh, You'll get through it. Just hold stalactite. tight. <laughs> you are playing with the advantage that I'm not English by nature and I cannot play with the fantastic characteristics of the language. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> I don't know how to follow that up. I don't know any parts. Moving on. So the, the lobsters kick them out of the jail uh, because they rather get a, uh, uh, let them get away than uh, than being eaten alive. And thus they continue their trip to the Crystal Mountain, which so you say the lobsters cave to him. <laughs> For those of you it's listening, I'm, I'm just trying to give James a conniption. I am seriously trying to think any rock pun, and I can't. I am no. going back on all my knowledge of a ge- uh, geological uh, 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 studies that I actually had to go through when I was growing up, and well, James, I can't think of any. Are you, are you saying that you just hit rock bottom? Shut up, Norm! <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Gee. Odd. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> uh, but anyway, let's move on before you kill me. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, uh, right after the, the, the not fight escaping from the uh, rock lobsters, they go all the way up to the crystal mountain, which is actually a very pitchy, easy way to go up. Uh, <laughs> Filled with dialogue, actually, which uh, I really like. Actually, really like how they what they're talking about in these panels. They talk about every single time that there has been a conflict or there has been a monster or a, something horrible happening in either Canterlot or Ponyville or in any part of Equestria, and Celestia hasn't done anything to stop it. Uh, and Spike is like, "Dude, what the hell? Why didn't you help us to stop these things?" And uh, I kind of like and understand the explanation Celestia gives is that it's very easy to just come down and fix the situation but then uh, Twilight or any of the subjects will not learn to fix the problem by themselves mm-hmm. um, because well it, it very much it's actually very true when for example when you make a mistake and uh, your parents are around or your friends are around you could Either uh, try and fix it yourself, or you could let them fix it for you. Uh, the problem is that if you let them fix the problems for you way too often, you don't learn how to fix them when they are not around. Right. Very, very good lesson right there. That is yeah. uh, that I now kind of like a, a cynical, a cynic will say, but Celestia should do it. Is it responsible to let uh, to let Twilight fence on, fence on her own? I think Twilight is capable of fencing this thing. She has proven that she can do it. True, true. Not a dissimilar, but I have a, a different take on it. Uh, one, I too like the idea that Celestia, with things like the dragon from Dragon Shy, the Diamond Dogs, the Paris Sprites, all that stuff. Yes, I, I, I do buy that Celestia could have uh, taken care of those, but chose to let the others work it out. And I don't have a problem with that. Uh, it may decrease the tension. But all in all, I do like the idea of letting your, your student learn by doing. But then there are other cases, and I, I kind of wish they'd said, like, Queen Chrysalis, I, I don't buy the argument that Celestia threw that match in order to teach a lesson. That that I would oh. classify as irresponsible. Uh, King Sombra, yes, she she beat him a thousand years ago, but with the help of her sister... And it seemed to take their combined power to, to beat him. I don't want to undermine that. Tyrick uh, and Discord, I think Celestia was not... I don't want to accept the idea that Celestia 
meant for all that to happen. That's that's uh, Norman why why I'm a little hesitant for everything's a lesson. That's the parts where it starts to feel a little irresponsible on her part. I don't want to say that every challenge to date has been something Celestia could handle. Well, and this some... uh, th- this comic came out before the the Tyrek, uh episodes were out. In, in the context of that theme, that there are there are challenges that Celestia can't stack Take, up against. Yeah. I think it's a mistake of the fan base to assume that she is omnipotent. Well, she's not really omnipotent. And when you were saying about Chrysalis and all that, yeah, I can't totally agree with you. When you say that Chrysalis was a thing that she has no control over, she basically just had the stupid trousers on. She wasn't all that inspired. With the Crystal Empire, yeah, that was that was true. But yeah, when when you talk about the minor uh, conflicts, like uh, oh, the Flint from Brothers trying to take over the farm, or Awi Sotol trying to create that... Uh, 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 the the four hundred years of rel- relentless heat, or um, I don't know, uh, yeah, or like when they got thrown inside the comic and all that. Of course, you are not going to expect Celestia to come and help them. Uh, they have to help themselves. Mm, true, true, true. I mean, what I meant to say was when Celestia doesn't butt in and give everyone test kind of situation is basically for the mundane, like Dragon in Ponyville. Yeah, that's you, mundane. Well, technically. <laughs> well, she sent the Wonder Balls. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about Spike. I'm talking about the dragon in uh, Stairmaster. Dragon Shy? Yeah, Dragon Shy, yeah. Although, when, when that's mundane by standards, I can see why Twilight has so many nervous breakdowns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that's, I guess that just the theme is, there are challenges that Celestia w- wouldn't be able to fix. And I guess as much as I love the message in this comic, uh, there's also times to acknowledge that Celestia is sometimes out of her – a villain is out of her power level. Yeah. It's true, it's but true. there's also uh, one other line that Celestia says that I find interesting. But I do not – emphasis on not – do this because I am cruel or because I want to play a joke on Twilight – I have to wonder if the scriptwriter hasn't been to the Brony fandom and caught the Trollestia, Tyrantlestia jokes that some fans like to make. The writer is Ted Anderson. Of yeah. course he has. I don't think so. He just went to cons and do, those questions are just popped at him. <laughs> Truthfully, I've never considered Celestia cruel or tyrannical, yeah. but I, I still get a kick out of those jokes online because they're so out of character. I find them funny. Yeah. Well, that is always the, the, the whole debate about, oh, Celestia not doing anything, sitting on her bum, just signing things all day and just waiting for Twilight to send friendship reports. Even in the theme song, even in the in the main title screen, she's just there sitting there Do waiting you... for the letter to appear and that's it. Uh, it is. It has become a trope. Being in a position of power is not easy. People think that, oh, you just sit down and... Things get done. I mean, no. Being in a higher position means you have a lot of more. Res- you have a lot more responsibility to take care of. Some people don't really see that. Oh well, we have been harping on this for a while. So next scene is Spike finding lens. Yay! Very easily so as well. Like I said, this is. Uh, they are just laying there. Wow. <laughs> And apparently Spike is is good enough that he can identify the quality of the crystals by sniffing them, which kind of <laughs> makes sense as well because, A, his expert is in jewels and they are still crystals. So why wouldn't he know about it? And he also can declares sapphires as juicy. Still trying to figure that out. <laughs> hey, hey, whatever he does in his private time with sapphire shows is another thing, man. Ooh, kinky. <laughs> but oh. as they are leaving the, the top of the mountain... Uh, <laughs> oh, God, no! <laughs> sabotage! I am being sabotaged! <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, yeah, as they are leaving the top of the mountain... Uh, explosion! Eruption! <laughs> and, uh, come on, go ahead, do it. You're waiting for it. <laughs> I don't have an explosion... Well, let's see here. This is the closest you I know. got to explosion. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, we could have an interactive uh, oh, review right now. But yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, volcanic eruption happens, which makes me wonder how often might this happen. That uh, uh, it well, it could happen often enough. 
uh, who knows, magical world, whatever, and they start running away and uh, escaping the, the the lava bombs or whatever they are called. I don't I don't remember. They, I'm pretty sure they have a name. I think it's and, just Goku and Vegeta fighting. <laughs> And they they run away, but oh no! The spike dropped the lenses. They fall into the lava. Ah, no problem. The spike is fireproof. <laughs> As are the He's lenses, so... apparently. Those are the lenses. Yeah. Well, I I'm not sure how how much do they have to heat up in order for uh, glass to to melt. Well, you forgot. This is not glass. This is crystals. Crystals. <laughs> crystals. Hey, Silver. Why don't you ask Sombra what he knows about this, man? Uh, all, all he says is crystals, and then you know he he gets a little uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, <laughs> moving on. But yeah, he's about to fall off a lava waterfall. This is so metal. <laughs> Anytime they throw anything dragon wise, it's so metal. And uh, Celestia saves his life, but they are about to get crushed by a meteor thingy coming from the volcano, and they get ca- caught inside a cave. Yeah, I, I do like spikes. Um, expression or the way Grabowska drew Spike here. He's so cute. <laughs> like those two dotted eyes. <laughs> Sorry, which two dots? Oh, where, where Celestia is saving him? or After where the big fiery ball of death is going to hit them. Ah, If we want to talk about expressions, how about where Celestia is saying, hang on Spike in her Arr! face. <laughs> how often do you get to see Celestia's Arr! face? Hang on <laughs> Like, Ooh, ooh, I've, I've got ooh. a I've got a new uh, term for a pl- princess Ur Lestia. <laughs> princess Ur Lestia. She's the girliest of the princess. Most hardcore <laughs> of the princesses. But uh, trapped in the cave, uh, Spike says, "Oh no, I'm gonna get us out of here. I'm gonna push the boulder out of the way." And yeah. of course, he can't because no matter how fireproof he is, he's still a tiny dragon. So yeah. Celestia goes and blasts the ro- the rock out of existence, and. Uh, a spike is like, oh, why do you have to do it? I had to, uh, I, I, you had to be the one doing it. Oh no, you didn't have to. We're in this adventure together. You have to know that every, of course, and I like the the way that she she puts it there that every teacher has to recognize when a problem is too big for a student. Hmm. Silver, do you want to take this one? Because well, I, pre- I, yeah. Hmm? Go, no, go but, ahead. Go ahead. There have been times where it seems like Celestia is putting too much on Twilight that. It it does come feel more like abandonment than education, but that's that is a very subjective approach. I mean, it, arguably Twilight has come through, and the only way to learn is by pushing them. Uh, I gotta be honest when I when I look at the series overall, I like the theme that Celestia presents Twilight with lessons, but not in the middle of a major crisis. Uh, to my eyes, the time to give her those tests of selflessness and courage are with the minor stuff, so she's ready for the big stuff in the middle. But in this case, where she's recognizing that Spike can't physically lift that boulder, that makes a lot of sense. And she doesn't she doesn't say out of the way Spike. She doesn't she doesn't degrade him by helping. Well she said, uh, degrading degrading Spike will be out of character for Celestia. She doesn't degrade others. Uh intentionally but- so but it but it, it can also come across unintentionally by saying one side spike I'll take care of this just brush him aside she doesn't do that she <laughs> she in fact uh, sorry just double checking the wordage here she says let me I believe yep those are the lines yeah he she lets him try he gets frustrated and she gently rests a hoof on his shoulder it's very kind very supportive she's almost asking him Spike allow me to help you oh let me take a shot at this. Yeah, it's like, so, I know you're kind of over your head. Let me try. Mm-hmm. I'm here to help as your friend. And I yeah. like that. I, I enjoy that yeah. presentation. That puts the both of them on the same level. That puts them, like you said, that puts them both as equals. Yeah, and the last line, you weren't the only adventurer on this trip as they walked through the sunset. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, we got Little John now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Little John. Yeah. Did you like the comic? <laughs> what? <laughs> I said, you like the comment? What? This will go on for hours if you guys don't stop me. I'll do it too. No, 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 no. Let's let's not do that. Okay. So, oh my God. Before, before we get more hijinks with this with the sound box. Uh oh no, I I, I summoned it. Um, but yeah, comic ends. Uh, just uh, they get the crystals to starry eyed. 
Twilight gets her telescope. Sky, Spike gets his uh, a letter, and uh, th- and they all learn a valuable lesson that you don't have to under uh, you don't have to underestimate yourself uh, despite how little you think you do for others. It's a very rushed sequence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is. This is probably the weakest part of the entire comic. Is that it ends in like, bring pang pang. It's like, oh, we get here. Okay, get you the present. Less on the end. Okay, whoa, 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 what I mean, what? It's like, if this had happened uh, in the cartoon, if this had been animated, it will be like, blink and you'll miss it. Literally. Because <laughs> it happens in the bat of an eye. Tell me, I do like this. I do like the comics. But um, we haven't reached final thoughts, right? Well, I, I do we want haven't... to comment on the on the last page. Well, I agree that I agree that the, the, res, the denouement is very hasty. In fact, if this were a Tolkien... Uh, adventure they'd probably just be on the first quarter of the book <laughs> now they've got to be attacked by 50 things on the way home <laughs> yeah and but, if this was directed by peter jackson it will last seven comics and half of them will be just walking <laughs> but i i do like celestia's letter that she feels like yes i can be an adventurer at times that i'm not trapped by my own role nor are you and that despite their very awkward beginning they are now very good friends. And I think, hooray, th- this is why this is my second favorite comic. It is just uh, this wonderful matchup of two characters who have almost nothing in common at first, and yet they share an experience and become closer friends. I mean, it's like, uh, hold this up for future, for other writers as they produce this series. Guys, more like this, please. See issue one? We will hurt you if you do that. <laughs> Be issue two. Oh, th- sorry, three. This is issue three. Two and three. Be like that. But anywho, final thoughts, anywho. gang? Yeah, let's go with final thoughts. And uh, like before, let's let's go alphabetical reversed. Well, like, well, I think I've uh, pretty much said all I can say, just that it is my second favorite, but only by fact that uh, a later comic had an even more unlikely pairing. And so I I enjoyed that even more. But... This is the Celestia I'd like to see more of in the show. This is the Spike I'd like to see more of in the show. And I don't feel that either one was diminished or usurped by the other. I don't think less the main six, because these two enjoyed a fun outing for one issue. Uh, So some of the paranoia about expanding the focus to other characters I don't think is justified. Mm -hmm. And this comic is a strong example of why. I go back to the whole thing where I say that each comic has a lesson. And the lesson here is, well, I don't think it's that obvious because you have Spike here um, wanting to help Twilight get a present and said present has to be in a really dangerous mountain with rock lobsters and a pit of lava pools. And you have Celestia here joining into the adventure wanting to do the same thing. And... (coughs) What What is the lesson here? Teacher knows how to see students' potential and whatnot, or, or what so? I mean, the lesson here is not overt. You have to really think about it just to get it. But from what I can tell or from what I read, I enjoy this very much. And the pairing for Spike and Celestia, it's rare. And that's what I like about the Friends Forever series, that you can add in strange combos who knows maybe in the future issue you'll have Brayburn and um, Big Mac probably I don't know well those kind of make sense because they are family like uh, <laughs> I don't see, I, I would like to see Brayburn and Sorin but then again the shippers oh yeah don't 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 Ooh. go down that road <laughs> Ooh, Brayburn and Sapphire Shores oh. ooh la la <laughs> oh I like that uh, okay Sensational! Appaloosa! <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Um, uh, I really like the comic. I really like the interaction between Spike and Celestia. I, to me, it's, uh, it's, uh, for those of you, okay, I could recommend this comic for those people that really like sidekicks. And now that, uh, when a push comes to shove, the sidekicks usually are the ones that save the day, uh, or we want them to save the day because they are the, the they are the down to earth characters. They are the ones that uh, never 
hug the spotlight, and they are usually there to be bill and fodder. They are usually there to be captured, be kidnapped, or be the comedic relief. In this comic, they don't do that. They take two characters that have been treated uh, not completely well by the actual show, and they give them a lot of dignity. They give them uh, they give them a lot of utility. They are not useless when uh, when something goes wrong and Celestia can't uh, can't fix it. Spike will take uh, will take care of it and fix it. And when Spike can't uh, can't take care of it, Celestia will. So they work of each other really great when it comes to the action, and they work of each other really great when it comes to the character. Their dialogue doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel artificial. It feels very natural. And the best part is that they take these two characters and they literally isolate them. They don't take them to work with the main six. They, they, in fact, the main six, they get completely uh, left behind, and we only see them in the last couple of pages. And the rest of the comic is just Celestian Spike and nothing else. They are just them alone, mm -hmm. giving them room to breathe, room to expand, room to uh, develop each other and uh, work of each other's personalities. Thankfully, uh, that's what the comic is about, and that's what the comic gets right. If only the conclusion wasn't that rushed. It would be a perfect round score for me if the conclusion wasn't so quickly put together. That uh, It has to suck having a limit of pages, uh, because I'm pretty sure if this comic had like three or four more pages, it will have a fantastic conclusion. It wouldn't be as rushed, and uh, it will be a perfect score for me. But as it stands right now, it's a very, it's a very good comic, and I highly recommend it. Yes. Now, uh, here's a question though: if if the main six have been left behind, where's the Nicolas Cage pony? <laughs> <laughs> oh, why, why Nicolas Cage? Uh, if you, you've obviously haven't seen Left Behind. Oh, which I commend God. you. I was trying to put that out of my memory. <laughs> I won't allow it. Oh, God. You'll have to kill me first. <laughs> you shot me! <laughs> Why did you shoot me in the arm? You're repeating your jokes. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> but anywho, James. But yes, they still hit the uh, bullseye. <laughs> oh, oh, no. I, I'm going to put a primer band on that thing. <laughs> you can't. Oh. We, we 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 set it loose now. It's self-aware. Oh, Soundboard went self-aware. It's like Skynet. Oh, oh no! God. But anyway, final thoughts done, right? <laughs> so what's next yeah, week's no. comic? Well, <laughs> <laughs> next week uh, we're going to be reading Friends Forever issue number four, written by Rob Anderson with art by Amy Meverson and colors by Heather Breckel. Oh yeah, that uh, is the Shining Armor and Twilight Sparkle Friends Forever comic. It's a sibling issue. Let's see. Let's see how how well they take care of uh, Prince Plot Point. Plot hole. <laughs> Just shiny. Uh, I, said, right. I gave you my Prince, heart uh, and then you turn around. <laughs> the, the Prince of Full Moons. Seriously. <laughs> pretty pretty unicorn boy, but. <laughs> personality of a wet blanket anyway uh, so this has been uh, the NBA show reviews uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it and I will see you all next week this has been James Cork and Norman Sanzo and Rock Lobster Silver Quill you mooks even though Norman does a better voice <laughs> yeah you say <laughs> I have to put up with these two guys <laughs> help me Luna help me Rock see, on. You, uh, see you guys next time <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go there again and ask for it. Bye. Adios.